This video addresses the management of arrhythmia, or abnormal heart rhythm, an emergency in pediatric patients. Many of the arrhythmias we discuss have recognition and treatment algorithms that can be found in your provider manual. Refer to them for more information. To determine appropriate action when evaluating the heart rate and rhythm in any seriously ill or injured child, you must consider the child's typical heart rate and baseline rhythm and the child's level of activity, age, and clinical condition. The signs of instability in a patient with arrhythmia are respiratory distress or failure, shock with poor end organ perfusion, which may occur with or without hypotension, irritability or a decreased level of consciousness, chest pain or a vague feeling of discomfort in older children, and sudden collapse. The most common pediatric arrhythmias are sinus bradycardia, atrioventricular or AV block, sinus tachycardia, and supraventricular tachycardia. Bradycardia is a lower than normal heart rate. In children, the most serious cause is severe hypoxia. As a result, the initial treatment is bag mask ventilation with 100% oxygen. If the bradycardia persists and the heart rate is less than 60 per minute with poor perfusion, start CPR. Consider giving epinephrine or atropine. AV block is a delay in conduction of the electrical impulse through the heart caused by a problem with the AV node. Many AV blocks require no treatment, while some may result in a very low ventricular rate and can worsen to cardiopulmonary compromise. These AV blocks require a pacemaker. Sinus tachycardia is a rapid heart rate that develops when high cardiac output is needed, such as with fever, excitement, and exercise. The presence of sinus tachycardia should prompt a search to identify the underlying cause of the tachycardia. Some causes may be significant or even life-threatening, requiring urgent intervention, while others may be fairly benign and require no intervention or only require ongoing monitoring. Superventricular tachycardia, or SVT, is the most common arrhythmia in children. SVT is generally characterized by an abrupt increase in heart rate that does not vary with activity. This isn't a life-threatening problem for most children. Emergency treatment is considered only if episodes are prolonged, frequent, or cause cardiorespiratory compromise. Ventricular tachycardia, VT, is an uncommon but potentially fatal condition and requires prompt attention. VT may also cause cardiac arrest, which requires CPR and immediate defibrillation for survival. VT may result from serious heart disease, but occasionally occurs in children with otherwise normal hearts. Priorities in the management of arrhythmias are the same as they are for all critically ill children. Support the ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation, and treat the underlying cause. Because we've already reviewed the ABCs, we'll now focus on different therapies for specific arrhythmias. We will discuss vagal stimulation as well as pharmacologic and electrical therapies. In SVT, if the child is stable, vagal stimulation may terminate the tachycardia by slowing conduction through the AV node. If possible, obtain a 12-lead ECG before and after the maneuver, record and monitor the ECG continuously during the maneuver. If the child is unstable, attempt vagal maneuvers only while making preparations for pharmacologic or electrical cardioversion. Do not delay definitive treatment to perform vagal maneuvers. Ice to the face is a vagal maneuver that can be performed in infants and children of all ages. Children old enough to cooperate can perform a Valsalva maneuver by blowing through a narrow straw. While vagal maneuvers are commonly used for the treatment of SVT, they are not always successful. Sometimes pharmacologic or electrical cardioversion is required. Adenosine is the most common medication for the pharmacologic cardioversion of SVT. It blocks conduction through the AV node for about 10 seconds. A common cause of adenosine cardioversion failure is that the drug is administered too slowly or with inadequate IV flush. To enhance delivery to the site of action in the heart, use a rapid flush technique. This is described as a rapid bolus delivery of the drug flushed immediately with 5 to 10 milliliters normal saline bolus. A brief 10 to 15 second period of severe bradycardia or asystole may occur after effective drug action. On rare occasions, electrical cardioversion is required. 
Synchronized cardioversion is an electrical therapy used to convert tachyarrhythmias with a pulse, primarily supraventricular and ventricular tachycardia, to sinus rhythm. When cardioversion is used for tachyarrhythmias with a pulse, it must be synchronized. Failure to synchronize the defibrillator may result in the shock being delivered on the T wave, causing ventricular fibrillation. Synchronized cardioversion may be performed in children who are awake and alert. Procedural analgesia and sedation should be considered, but medication must be carefully chosen to minimize adverse cardiorespiratory effects. And whenever possible, establish vascular access and provide procedural analgesia and sedation before cardioversion, especially in a hemodynamically stable child. However, synchronized cardioversion should not be delayed to obtain IV access or administer sedation medications in a hemodynamically unstable child. Although defibrillators vary, there are common general steps for performing synchronized cardioversion. First, turn on the defibrillator and attach appropriately sized and positioned pads to the patient. Next, select the synchronization mode and look for markers above R waves, which indicate that the sync mode is active. Then, select the appropriate energy dose. The initial energy dose should be between 0.5 and 1 joule per kilogram. If subsequent shocks are required, increase the dose to two joules per kilogram. Once the appropriate energy dose is selected, charge the defibrillator. Charging. Before delivering the shock, firmly communicate to the team that you are charging the defibrillator clear. and they need to stand clear. Once the team is clear, deliver the shock. Shocking in three, two, one. Shock delivered. After the shock, evaluate the patient and check the cardiac rhythm and the pulse. If cardioversion is successful, no further electrical interventions are necessary. If the tachyarrhythmia persists, prepare to perform cardioversion again at a higher energy dose. You must reset to the synchronization mode because most defibrillators default to the unsynchronized mode after a shock. In the unlikely event ventricular fibrillation or pulseless ventricular tachycardia develops, begin CPR and prepare to deliver an unsynchronized shock as soon as possible. Cardiac arrest is the cessation of blood circulation resulting from absent or ineffective cardiac mechanical activity. Clinically, the child is unresponsive and not breathing or only gasping. There is no detectable pulse. pulse. No pulse. Let's start CPR. There are two general pathways that children take to develop cardiac arrest. The most common pathway for children is primarily due to the progression of respiratory failure or hypotensive shock. Either of these will progress to cardiac arrest if unrecognized, untreated, or unresponsive to medical therapies. The other pathway is sudden ventricular arrhythmias leading to acute cardiac arrest. Unlike in adults, this pathway is very uncommon in children. It is far more likely for children to have cardiac arrest due to progressive respiratory failure or hypotensive shock. Cardiac arrest states include asystole, pulseless electrical activity, ventricular fibrillation, and pulseless ventricular tachycardia, including torsade de point. For all these cardiac arrest states, CPR should be performed and emergency medication should be provided in accordance with the pediatric cardiac arrest algorithm. In pulseless electrical activity, PEA, organized electrical activity is present on the cardiac monitor, but the patient remains pulseless. Asystole, ventricular fibrillation, and ventricular tachycardia are not considered organized electrical activity. Cardiac arrest can be caused by precipitating and potentially reversible conditions requiring immediate intervention. These causes of cardiac arrest can be recalled by remembering the H's and T's. Let's review these now. Hypoglycemia is low serum glucose. Hypovolemia is low blood volume. Hypoxia occurs when inadequate oxygen is reaching the body's tissues. Hydrogen ion, or acidosis, is the accumulation of acid and hydrogen ions in the blood and body tissues. Hyperkalemia is an abnormally high concentration of potassium ions in the blood. Hypokalemia is low blood potassium. Hypothermia is when the body temperature drops below 95 degrees Fahrenheit or 35 degrees Celsius. Tension pneumothorax results from an abnormal accumulation of air in the pleural space. Cardiac tamponade is a condition caused by an accumulation of fluid between the heart and the pericardium. Toxins may be best uncovered by a focused history. A pulmonary thrombosis or pulmonary embolism is a blood clot from a large vein that breaks off and travels to the pulmonary artery where it becomes lodged. A coronary thrombosis is a blood clot that forms within a blood vessel of the coronary system. 
CPR alone may not save the life of a sudden cardiac arrest victim. A shockable arrest rhythm requires CPR and defibrillation. Defibrillation depolarizes the heart so that it stops the ventricular fibrillation. This is similar to the action of rebooting a computer. It allows the heart's normal rhythm to resume. A manual defibrillator is preferred to an AED because it allows adjustment of the shock dose for use on infants and children. The operation of manual defibrillators requires skill and rhythm analysis because when the manual mode is used, there is no computer rhythm analysis or prompting. The operator must determine the need for shock delivery and determine the correct shock dose. The steps for properly performing defibrillation by using a manual defibrillator are the same for performing synchronized cardioversion with two important exceptions. First, there is no need or indication to hit the sync mode. After the pads are attached, you immediately select the desired energy levels. The second difference between cardioversion and defibrillation is that the energy levels used are higher when defibrillating. For defibrillation, select the appropriate energy dose. For the first defibrillation, choose an energy dose between 2 and 4 joules per kilogram. For the second defibrillation attempt, select an energy dose of 4 joules per kilogram. If additional shocks are needed after the second shock, doses of up to 10 joules per kilogram may be used. A general memory aid is 2468. That's the dose to defibrillate. Again, this is a general approach and not absolute. Each shock should not exceed the recommended starting or subsequent adult defibrillation dose for that specific defibrillator model. Defibrillation is always done in the context of CPR. After each shock, immediately resume CPR for about two minutes before rechecking the rhythm and pulse. Arrhythmias and cardiac arrest states are uncommon in children. The ability to rapidly identify them and immediately intervene can be life-saving. Just as important is preventing cardiac arrest. In children, cardiac arrest states are typically due to the progression of respiratory failure or hypotensive shock states. Accordingly, the ability to rapidly identify these conditions and immediately intervene can be life-saving as well.